Good afternoon. Welcome to the second campus conversation. I'm Greg Fenvis, and I'm uh, very glad to uh, see a terrific turnout among, uh, among the faculty and to welcome you to a uh, program that I think will be very interesting, uh, very useful as we think through uh, the value proposition for residential undergraduate education at our great research university. Uh, the topic for today is leveraging technology for teaching and learning. And so a couple key words in there, technology. Well, we talked a little bit about that. Everybody here, I think, is obviously an expert and, uh, or at least interested. Uh, but technology in education is not new. It's, we've been using it in, in uh, using technology in education as long as computers have been at universities, which is going on four decades. Uh, and so this is a great time to talk about uh, the innovations that faculty uh, are developing in their courses now, uh, the experience of uh, what works and what doesn't work, uh, wh what are the technology trends and the roadmaps that we should be looking at as a university. Uh, the other key word is teaching. Um, that is our core mission as a uh, part of our core mission as a university. Uh, as I think any uh, educator, any teacher um, has learned uh, using a new technology, no matter what it is, affects the way you teach whether it was going from chalkboard to whiteboard, uh, going from overhead projectors to PowerPoint, uh, going from uh, slides to videos, uh, to lecture capture, to learning management systems, all the technology, at least as, a, uh, as, as in my experience, it always changed the way I thought about what I was teaching and how I was teaching, and I'm sure uh, that's gonna be an important theme today. And the third key word is learning. Um, how is technology helping our students learn, help achieve the outcomes and the goals that we have for our courses and our degree programs? And in this era, uh, which is not such a new era, but still an era of big data, how we can use that information uh, to improve uh, what we do and in teaching and in the students uh, learning uh, the valuable content and the knowledge that you're transmitting in your courses. Uh, so we have a, a great panel here. We're going to call up uh, Lori Holleran uh, Stryker from the School of Social Work uh, to moderate. But to kick off this event, we're going to use technology. We have a video. So roll the video. And welcome to Introductory Psychology. I am Sam Gosling. And I'm Jamie Pennebaker. This is a little bit like, you may have heard of something called a MOOC. This is called a SMOC, a synchronous massive online class. Every class day we will be broadcasting to several thousand people. And you'll be able to watch this class, you'll be able to watch it live, and you'll be in a little, in a community, of a chat room community that you'll be able to talk about the lecture as it's going on. You can ask questions to us and to others in the room. So it's a very uh, dynamic way of teaching. Yeah, so I think, you know, a perfectly reasonable way to argue this um, is in a way from a, your personal point of view, which is, um, how do you feel? I mean, one of my kind of general tenets, and you know, I tell my Latin teachers this all the time, is you want to get every student as engaged as possible at every moment of the class, which is really hard to do. And peer discussion does that. So here's a uh, question for you. <laughs> Largely what works best is starting with some kind of prompt. And in my case, it was often an eye clicker question um, that, and would have a question up there. And then there'd be something about that question. And it might be that everyone got the question right, but there was something about the question that I could ask a follow-up question or I could do something with it. Um, yeah, so this is one of the really complex questions, and again, this came up on Piazza. Okay, now talk to your neighbor about X. You want it to be a pretty focused point, and something, what I found worked best was pretty focused and give them about a minute. That sort of kept them on task, and then would have either a re-poll or then a new poll would come up that actually dealt with the question. But doing that kind of back and forth between the clicker questions and the talk to your neighbor 
really worked well and keeping, I mean, almost again, like a kind of um, dance where you're saying, okay, now you're doing this, now you're doing that, now you're doing this. And it kind of kept them moving around. D'où venez-vous? Je viens de Lyon. Vous n'êtes pas parisienne? Non, je suis lyonnaise. To me, how language technology or how technology has changed language teaching is uh, the idea of uh, the internet as communication technologies. So we're using tech, we're using the internet to get our students in close contact with native speakers. C'est-à-dire? Oh, généralement la cuisine. Uh... Uh, it's not simply that it's delivering static content. No, it's it's going virtually online to another country to interview a, a, a native speaker of French or to go to a website and get information and then use that information with a native speaker to accomplish a real communicative goal. That's something that we've never been able to do before that has completely changed foreign language teaching. And so if we think about the pressure from air and the pressure we feel coming down from the atmosphere on top of us, it's from collisions with both oxygen molecules and nitrogen molecules. The, the students that are taking our general chemistry class were required to view a learning module the night before class. So they had a little bit of background um, in that. And depending on the activity, sometimes we have them do more or less prep. Sometimes we want them to discover the skill in a supported environment. Sometimes we want them to preview the skill and then practice the skill. So it's a difference um, in these types of activities. It's a difference if we're discovering a skill uh, or concept versus uh, practicing a new skill or concept. Watch, watch. Let's see what's happening. Oh, oh. There's some sort of movement with the balloon. And the students know in class we're usually working. We're not testing. So it's okay to make mistakes. It's not, it's not an exam. So now is the time to get it right. Now is the time to get the mistake out in the open. Now is the time to turn it around. Because you can be up at the board and do the problem completely wrong. And in fact, you get bonus points for that. So um, because that helps everybody to learn it better. Thank you, Provost Fendez, and, and uh, for the entire team that put this incredible event together. We're really excited to share our panel with you and some follow-up questions. You even, even get, we'll, we'll get the opportunity to play with clickers if you haven't already. Uh, so we're making this an experiential day as well as a presentation. So uh, hopefully we're modeling what we are presenting. Um, I am so grateful to introduce to you a very diverse a uh, group of faculty who are committed to technology and utilize it in a number of different ways. Uh, so we're going to start with introductions, and I'm going to ask each faculty member to introduce them th themselves by name and department, and their, what their relationship with technology was in the past, what it's like now, and how they see themselves utilizing technology for teaching and learning in the future. Thanks. Um, I am Jen Ebler. You got to see me talking up there and saying um a lot. I am in the classics department, and my relationship to technology really started when I came to UT, I guess, 12 years ago, um, with chalk and slide carols. Um, so this was back before you could search Google for images. We had to pull slides and show them in our large classes. For me, the decisive moment um, where I really started to embrace technology in teaching particularly large classes, so teaching at scale, had to do with the, um, being able to pilot the Echo 360 lecture capture system, which is now in a number of classrooms um, in the college. And I know a lot of people feel a lot of anxiety about using this, um, worry that students aren't going to come to class, worry that somehow it's going to, to interfere with um, learning. And I had the same kinds of anxieties, but kind of decided that it was worth an experiment. And I could always just shut it off in the middle of the semester. And what I actually found was that it completely changed how students learned and how they interacted with the course material. It also changed what I could do in class. Suddenly, I could use the personal capture version on my computer. 
I could tape things that really we didn't need to talk about in class, like going over an exam where I was just giving information. Um, and then I could use class time more effectively. And that really is what started an enormous transformation of a class that now incorporates a wide range of pretty basic technologies. As you saw, eye clickers, talk to your neighbor. I use Scantron midterm exams. I use Scantron quizzes. Um, it's not high tech in that sense. It just uses a lot of different tools. And for me, it's very much about using the technology to improve the pedagogy. And so it's always thinking about how is this technology letting me do something in class that I couldn't otherwise do? How do I make the best use of the time in class? And so always trying to think about what kinds of technology are going to let me do things more effectively face to face with that time. And at the present time, where I am now, I've flipped my 400 student Rome class, or blended it is probably a better term. And where I am now is actually trying to develop that as an online class, which has this whole other set of challenges of now how do you translate what you're doing face to face into a purely technological medium. Um, and that's, that's not easy to do. Um, and it's something that, that we're very much experimenting with and we'll be assessing, and I'm sure making a lot of adjustments as we go. Hello, I'm Steve Lindbergh. I'm in the business school. And I've been here a long time, so I was certainly using chalkboards as well when I first arrived. Uh, 31 years, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I think my introduction to what we're thinking of now as technology was, oh, some years ago, I perched a webcam over a sheet of paper and started doing some homework problems, videoed, posted. And you know, the students thought that was pretty good. They seemed to be getting good feedback about, on that. And so thought I might better explore uh, the capabilities using technology to uh, enhance my classes and cast about for readings as well as other connections. Actually, the Center for Teaching and Learning has a great series of seminars and workshops, and so that was very helpful. I also went to a natural sciences specific workshop, and uh, uh, Sasha Kopp, as a matter of fact, was presenting at that one, and he has a flipped classroom, and he kindly let me come and visit his classroom, sit in on it, see how it all operated, as well as I had the opportunity to speak to students and their personal take on the experience. And as a result, uh, became an energized about that, and so now I and some colleagues who teach the same course are in the process, or it's, it's a, prog a, a project in process, you might say, but we have taken steps to flip that classroom. And uh, proceeding that way now with colleagues was now enfranchising and sharing with others. But not long ago, about a year and a half ago, uh, because of the inspiration of our dean in the college business, Dean uh, Cunningham, uh, <laughs> Dean, uh, dean Gilligan, we, uh, uh, decided that we were going to prioritize on taking what you might know as the business foundation courses. If you don't, these are courses that are offered to non-business students all the way all across campus in the foundations of business. And they're taught in typically very, very large section sizes. And so we made them a commitment, in fact, a very high priority for the college, is to convert those to an online format as an option to students, not in lieu of the face-to-face -face classes. And as a result, uh, we embarked on this adventure. Now, I'm the coordinator of that project, which entails across these six courses some uh, 17 faculty. And I thought also another uh, wise um, uh, bit of direction was to acquire faculty who were, in this case, every one of them is a, a, a teaching award recipient. And three to four of them are in the distinguished Academy of Distinguished Teachers. And across the six teams, five of them have either, either current or former department heads. And therefore, there's a lot of guidance and leadership from the top, as well as a greatly motivated set of faculty who are highly skilled. Now, the disadvantage of that is that, of course, when you get faculty that are that strong, they are in high demand. And so staying on timelines has been a challenge. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> we can elaborate on that if it comes up and other things. Uh, and so uh, just one or two other contours before I pass on the, uh, the podium here. But another contour to this program is that the online portion is designed to be asynchronous. It's designed to be self-paced. We would not initiate the project that way. We want to keep as few dials turned as possible until we learn by experience. And we have a partner, a company called Deltac, who provides everything from soup to nuts when it comes to developing and uh, launching and even monitoring 
uh, students in terms of um, the implementation of the courses. And they've been very helpful, I might add. And the audience, as I mentioned, the internal audience, the University of Texas students, a very high priority. Our goal there is to expand uh, the opportunities for those students to take these courses, which are in very high demand. And also, with this cadre of faculty, have the highest quality. Uh, and you can certainly imagine we, we have good possibilities of that if you consider a 300-person class and what you can do with technology. And another, uh, to wrap up, another uh, audience for this is external. And once again, that's a bit of entrepreneurship in the sense that we don't know in the end who's going to come. But another function that our partner plays is out beating the bushes across whether they be other universities, UT system or otherwise, uh, corporations, and um, just individuals who are interested in taking the course. So that is what is consuming my days lately. I'm Jamie Pennebaker. I'm in the psychology department. And um, I guess my first uh, interaction with technology was putting a penny in the uh, in a light socket when I was very young and this learning experience has stuck with me forever and I kind of view that as a, a model of how one should use technology which is over the years I, I I love gizmos I love playing with stuff and I see what works and what doesn't some things work for me some haven't PowerPoint, I know many of you love it in the class. I think it's pure evil. Uh, the point is, is you do what works for you. I uh, stumbled into the, this giant class that Sam Gosling and I are teaching purely by accident. He and I, several years ago, we had both been teaching intro psych together, were walking somewhere, and we came up with this idea, wouldn't it be interesting to teach, this, teach two back-to-back -back classes of 500 students each, and we would both uh, join forces and teach in the, in, together. We'd both be up on stage together. And one of the reasons we did this is because we also do a lot of research. We do research with, with students, and we give students, we tell them about the research we're doing, and part of it was just a, another way to do really exciting research. Uh, we figured by joining forces, we do half the amount of work, and of course, anybody who's ever done something like this, you end up doing twice as much work. And he and I both do research that are, is relevant to teaching. We never appreciated that as much until we started working together. And one of the projects I was doing was looking at natural language. And I was interested in developing a system where you could have people type something in into a computer and it would run through my computer text analysis program and give people feedback about their personality. And I'd already developed that. And then it occurred to me, well, you could probably do that with groups of people. So we set up a system where we would have five people typing together, and the computer would monitor them, and we could give feedback to the group. So we could tell the group if someone was talking too much, you know, you might you know, stand back and encourage others to talk, or you could determine if people were paying attention to one another or not. And then it occurred to me, wouldn't that be interesting to have that in our class? So we, we set it up and got some help from, the, from Liberal Arts and then later C, CTL, the Center for Teaching and Learning. And we developed a system so we could have all 500 students bring their laptop to class and we could break them into small groups. And as long as we did that, we thought, why not change the whole nature of testing? So what we did was we set it up so we have a test at the beginning of every class which, by the way, is a really interesting pedagogical technique, which we didn't know. It just seemed interesting to us. And we found that this method of teaching was really efficient, that students learned much more quickly, that our performance on tests were better than they'd ever been, and the disparity between upper middle and lower middle class students dropped from about a letter grade to about half a letter grade. And these are with really big samples, and we could compare our numbers with the, the classes we taught in the past. This led us to develop this online class, and the next thing that we started playing with is, well, you know, we've, since Socrates, people have pretty much stood up in front of a class and taught that way. That's not the way students nowadays are, are seeing, uh, uh, you know, everyday entertainers. I mean, let's be honest, we are, education is partly entertainment. Look at John Stewart. And we, we, so we moved to this idea of, of, of making it kind of a fake news show, except that we would now talk about our research, we would have interviews, we would have different segments, 
And we've now evolved into, it's a really technologically reasonably sophisticated class uh, with, again, tremendous help from the university. But what it's done is we're using technology, but we change it all the time, and we're doing it because, A, it's a hell of a lot of fun. And, this, and B, the students just love it. And so they are paying attention. They are, this is, uh, unlike an asynchronous class, this is a synchronous class. And much like Jen talked about, we want to develop methods that get the students and, and get them engaged and maintain that engagement over the entire hour and 15 minutes. And so we're trying to take advantage of, of kind of the basic principles of social behavior and social psychology, but also cognitive processes so that they're engaged and taking the class very seriously. So we're using this method now and we drive, you know, we're working with LATES and CTS Lates is the liberal arts ITS group, and uh, the CTS group. We're driving them nuts because we come up with new ideas of playing with technology in a new way the next day. And if things fall apart, that's fine. We'll come up with some other kind of system. So I guess in the big picture, my general approach is take advantage of whatever technology works for you. Dump, you know, don't put the penny in the, uh, I've learned this, do not put a penny in a socket more than once because you just don't learn anything new. Try something else and, uh, and enjoy it. Uh, my name is Darren Shaw. I'm in the government department here at UT. And uh, if I'm going to speak directly to the three questions, uh, where I started, well, I, I came here in 1994, and I was pretty cutting edge. Um, my good friend Rod Hart is there, and I can probably speak for Rod, and that we were cutting edge in the sense that we would actually show a political ad in our class on our VHS, you know, and uh, that was extremely impressive. In fact, I have a large library of political ads now and nothing to play them on. Um, <laughs> I guess in some sense, um, I was sort of standing still and a lot of technology was moving and overtook me, uh, especially during the 90s. So when classrooms became wired, that's sort of my, the, the next marker in my mind. You know, I showed up one day to, to Bats or Mezzi's or one of the newly decked out halls. I noticed that everybody had a laptop um, and everybody was online. And I, I thought they must be busily working on, you know, government sites and checking what I was saying out and make sure I was on top. Mostly they were on uh, ESPN.com. Um, some of them were on social sites. And uh, although I will say uh, one of my favorite moments was I, I was making a, con I was having a conversation about ideology and I said, Winston Churchill's famous line that, well, you know, Churchill says that if you're, you know, young and liberal, you have no heart, and if you're old and conservative, if you're young and uh, conservative, you have no heart, if you're old and liberal, you have no brain. And I got a little laugh, and then some kid raised his hand, and I said yes, and he said, uh, he says, according to this, Professor Shaw, there's some doubt that Churchill actually said that. <laughs> and at that point, I, I realized that um, I was in trouble, and I, I needed to really uh, source my information correctly. So, you, you know, they are on they are on the ball, and uh, it, it was also kind of a moment that that let me know I needed to kind of up my game a little bit. That not only the content of the course, but the mode of delivery uh, needed to change. So I guess that started me on a bit of an odyssey. Um, I worked with Jim Henson over at the Liberal Arts ITS uh, a couple years after that. So this was maybe uh, mid 2000s, and uh, we got a series of handheld devices, iPods, I think they were, uh, and and incorporated them into the classroom so that students could were allowed to give um, synchronous content evaluations. So we'd ask some survey questions. I was teaching a public opinion course. I would put up the opinions of Americans, or sometimes I'd withhold them and ask them a question and say, you know, what do you guys think on this? Give them the response options, and they would respond. And then we'd compare their responses to the response set of the United States to see, and then talk about, first of all, how to measure these sorts of things, as well as a comparison point, you know, the class versus the United States. Um, I made the conversion to PowerPoint at some point, not necessarily because I'm a believer in PowerPoint, but because the expectations with respect to students are, are unbelievable. If you do not make PowerPoint slides available to them, it, it, it's, it's an apostasy. I mean, they, they just go ape. Um, they, they think you're a Luddite. You know, you can't possibly understand learning in the 21st century if you don't have the slides. And you make those slides available. You know, we're talking about lecture, co lecture capture. Uh, they expect that now, too. And I've actually kind of relented on those grounds, uh, largely because they solve some problems. They solve some problems for students with disabilities. And they solve some problems for uh, students for whom English is a second language. 
Um, they allow those students to go back and review slides and content in a way that otherwise you have to come up with an independent um, sort of solution to those sorts of issues. So I, I was actually pretty happy. Now, where I am now, uh, Penn and Baker turned up the heat on all of us. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and LAITS decided they were going to show Jamie that it wasn't actually his class and that the <laughs> College of Liberal Arts had claim on it. They'd built out uh, not only a, an infrastructure, technological infrastructure, but also studio capacity. And they came to me and asked, um, the government department came to me and said, you know, is there anything we could do that's, that's sort of comparable like this to, to take advantage of the opportunities to reach larger audiences in a more efficient way and to spice things up a little bit as well? I teach the big intro to American government class. In this class, we usually have 400 students per class and eight sections of it. I mean, it is a legislatively mandated course, and so it's, it's actually a, a boon to government in the sense that we draw a lot of students into the, into the department and expose them to government. And the faculty, on the other hand, in terms of staffing, it's an enormous burden. Um, the American politics faculty in particular, basically, you gotta, you gotta do this once a year uh, to pull your weight and to make sure we're doing service for the university. I always, was dissatisfied with the way I taught that class. Um, a large class, the evaluations that I was able to, to offer the students were limited. You got a Scantron, a midterm Scantron. I can't have much of a writing component. I can't ask for a research question, a research paper. Uh, I probably can't ask for take homes because I got 400 students, you know, and a couple of TAs. Uh, when you move online, the possibilities with respect to evaluation and interaction expand, and they expand enormously. So we ripped off, uh, Professor Eric McDaniel and I have done this uh, in the intro class, and we're now teaching a class this spring with 1,100 students. Um, we do it Monday, Wednesday. We do it early in the morning uh, just to kind of ease the burden on bandwidth. Um, students can watch the class from anywhere, um, anywhere in the world, actually, where there's an acceptable browser and internet connection. They have quizzes every Monday on the reading that they did the previous week which, as Jamie suggested, is a nice way to make sure they keep up with the readings. They do 13 quizzes over the course of the semester. They drop their three low scores, and they keep their 10 best. But it keeps them moving. Um, we actually have them submit essays. They have three essays due each semester. Um, they submit them online. They run them through a plagiarism check, um, which is interesting. Um, and uh, we get them back to them within 10 days, essentially. The TA's comments are notated. Um, and the, the system is, is I, I can't give enough credit to LAITS for what they've done in building out the infrastructure for this. Now, there are problems with these sorts of classes and technologies. I'm not sure I'd recommend them at this point for upper division classes. I don't want to teach my upper division class online yet. Um, but it's an unbelievable opportunity, I think. And the university obviously needs to figure out how it's going to maintain its edge and separate, you know, how does Stanford or Princeton or UT separate itself from DeVry or Phoenix or these other universities or, you know, the, the TED classes or these things that basically provide these educational content without the costs, without the bricks and mortar that we offer at UT. Um, I think we have to explore these sorts of things to remain relevant. And where am I going to be in the future? I don't know. I don't know where I'm going to be at four. Um, <laughs> Uh, I do think technology will continue to sort of progress, and that will be incorporated. But, but it strikes me that uh, in a very narrow sense, uh, one of the issues that I have is, you know, we talked about these discussion groups, these opportunities for students to interact within the context of the classroom. We don't leverage that very well in our version of this class right now. Um, we have a chat session, but the chat session is running when they're supposed to be taking notes and listening online. So I'm, I'm, I'm not real crazy about that. On the other hand, they've created their own Facebook page and talk continually about the class. There's got to be a way to sort of sync that up a little bit and maybe give them a little more instruction, uh, make ourselves a little more accessible in that context. Um, but how we're going to accomplish that remains to be seen. Hi, I'm Janet Walker. I am from the College of Pharmacy. I joined the faculty in 2008. I have a little bit different background than um, my co-panelists here in that I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for the majority of my career. So the technologies that I was leveraging were technologies to help develop new drug products and get them commercialized. So when I came to the university, my first responsibility was for the institute, but I do teach courses every year. And I started teaching undergraduate courses. 
And even back when I was in the pharmaceutical industry, I was teaching an executive MBA class. So I'm very interested in teaching. Interestingly enough, after I taught that course a couple of times, a course in the program a couple of times, they asked me if I was interested in putting it online. And I said, why would I want to do that? And that was about a dozen years ago. And I just felt like it looked like a chore to me. And when I think about what I'm doing now, that's rather humorous. But when I came into the university, what I really was focusing on was to teach students about drug development. And the very first course I taught, I asked the students not to be from a science background. It was a signature course. Because I wanted to test out whether I could make non-science students understand something that has a scientific basis so that they could be the most savvy consumers other than pharmacy students on this campus. And it was very apparent within about six weeks that it was going to be a success because I put it in a context that they could understand. And so I've built on this, and now I teach graduate seminars in pharmaceutical entrepreneurship, and we have people from all over campus taking this course. And so when we were given the opportunity to develop a MOOC uh, last fall, um, I was very excited because I thought I could use all of these insights that I'd learned from teaching a variety of students across campus and roll that into a MOOC. I was ready to embrace technology. And it has just been an incredible experience. I can now actually have a conversation about Python and we're not talking about a snake. Um, I, can, I understand what persistence means, and that's not nagging. It's about having an environment where it can, can retain the information that you need. And I even know what gamification is. And so the experience of working in a MOOC was to be able to integrate what I had put together in my experiences of pedagogy for trying to reach both academic and leisure learners. And I really differentiate. And so when we went to create our MOOC, and it's called Take Your Medicine, um, we were trying to reach out to both those academic learners and leisure learners. Um, I always said I wanted to be able to have faculty on our campus want to take it and my 84-year-old mother be able to understand it. And that was my benchmark. And we were able to do that using some pretty innovative um, tools. We, we didn't formulate it like a traditional 15-week course. We made it an eight-week course. We didn't have 45-minute lectures. We had little sound bites, essentially, that ranged between one and six minutes for the most part. So people could feel like they could manage it. We also made it self-paced. So in other words, we never took material down. And yes, we had the typical quizzes that you have to have, but we also had what we called Know Your Medicine Learning Labs, where they had to go out and research something in order to be able to provide the answer. It was not in the lecture. And we were very happy. It was by MOOC standards, we had modest enrollment. We had about 23,000 students, but we did have a very high engagement rate of 70%. We had about double the average completion rate um, and while those are not the end-all measures, I'm the first one to say that, I will say that the way that we engaged on discussion boards, the way that we um, interacted in personal emails, it made it very clear that we were getting our message across, we were able to accomplish our goal. So I am now the biggest advocate of how we can use technology. One of the things that we found was very important if you're thinking about embarking on a MOOC is not only do you have to plan and plan and plan again, but you have to have a strategy. You, you are going to do a lot of work if you're considering putting a MOOC together, and you better have a thought in advance about how you can use that material in other ways. We're going to be using it in a four-credit on-campus course. We also plan to use it in a way that is, I'm in the process of getting it licensed for teaching academic researchers how to do drug development. That's the deep dive portion of it. We're also talking about maybe working with some of the, um, the um, chain pharmacies so they can provide information on how to be a savvy consumer because we had um, information about counterfeit drug products, should you buy drugs online, um, how to be a savvy consumer, how to talk to your healthcare professional. 
And so we provided a lot of different information, but we're also even in conversations with FDA now because they're in great need of providing information through their small, small business assistance program. So by having a strategy before we even started developing the material, we could kind of get the most bang for our buck, both in terms of delivering content, but also in terms of using our money wisely and our time uh, wisely. So where am I now? I really see that we can use technology to provide transformational educational experiences, both for our faculty and for students, whether you're teaching students on campus or around the globe. Because you know, when you put a MOOC out there, I lost count of how many countries that we had, but it was we had countries all over the world participating, and we had everyone from um, doctors and healthcare providers and pharmacists to self-proclaimed stay-at-home moms and dads. So the reach and the potential is enormous, and I would really encourage you. You know, this is not for the faint of heart. You have to put a lot of time into it, but once you do, there is a big payback. And what we're going to do with our next version, uh, because of some technology uh, limitations by the edX platform that we were using, we weren't able to do some of the things we wanted to do. We're in the process of, of um, putting out version 1.5, where we want our students to each have the capability to virtually develop a drug product their own drug product as part of the course, and it will go along with each of the modules. And at the end, we decided, even though most drug products never make it to the market, each of our students will have a very successful experience, and their products will be approved at the, at the end of the course. <laughs> or else. Or else. Hi, my name is Dee Dee Sparks, and I'm a social worker, a social work professor in the School of Social Work, obviously. And my previous relationship with technology is that I've been married for 37 years to an electrical engineer. And the secret to our happy and healthy marriage is that he is not allowed to upgrade my computer without my permission. And it drives him crazy how old some of my software is. Um, but I know how to use it, I know where everything is, and, and there's a hands-off rule there. Um, but I um, joined the faculty just two years ago. This is the end of my second year, and I teach a practice course for BSW students who are in their final field placement, and I teach with a, a faculty member who has been in the School of Social Work for about 25 years, 27 years, uh, quite some time. And one of the things that we had identified long before I got there, but we really started talking about it last semester, was that we have students who are in their field placement doing their internship for 36 to 40 hours a week, and then they were coming, undergrad students coming to a four hour class in the late afternoon and evening. And they were tired, they were exhausted, and it was really um, difficult to keep them engaged and, um, and really participating and actively participating in class when they'd been at work for you know, seven or eight hours, sometimes nine hours that day before class. So one of the other concerns is that we have domestic long distance and international students who are completing their internship overseas. I have two students in Ghana, and for them to participate in class, they were having to walk 30, 30 minutes into town, find an all-night internet cafe that the internet services were working, and then they would have to sit there because of the time difference from 11 o'clock at night till three in the morning and Skype into class, um, which, in the first place wasn't, I don't think, very safe for them, but in the second place, um, the School of Social Work is an older building and our infrastructure is not supportive of Skype. We tried Skype, we tried Adobe Connect, and it drops about every 15 or 20 minutes, sometimes more frequently, and it was taking a lot of class time to try to keep the students even just uh, technologically connected to class, much less could they hear. Sometimes we could see them, they couldn't see us. It was very disruptive. So we started just the end of December um, talking about what do we do, what's a better way. Um, we had gone to a presentation on the flipped classroom, so we kind of bounced that around a little bit. Um, two weeks before school started this semester, we met with uh, Mike Wallace and Doris Adams from the um, Center for Technology, uh, Teaching and Learning and talked about what are some ideas. We were thinking about flipping the classroom, having a blended classroom. Their enthusiasm was very catching. Um, every idea we kind of threw out um, just went viral. And so two weeks later, we had uh, transitioned our class onto Canvas and began a blended classroom. So it was very fast. Um, 
we kind of have gone by the seat of our pants. We're staying about uh, two weeks ahead of our students, but it has been fun, um, very well received by our students. We did a Survey Monkey uh, recently, and all but two of our students um, felt like this was the way to go, and they definitely preferred this, this over a traditional classroom setting. We've been able to reduce, we have an online module um, that's about one, t one hour to one hour and 15 minutes every week. We've really paid attention to the research that says that um, there is a shorter attention span than maybe we would uh, like for our students to have at the university level. And so we try to have no, uh, lectures that are no more than six to eight minutes long. They're accompanied by PowerPoint. We've used YouTube videos. We've used TED Talks. Um, we try to incorporate all sorts of social media into that module, and that's where the, the really basis of instructional learning comes in. We've reduced the time the students are in the classroom from four hours to two and a half hours, and that's made a significant difference on our students being um, able to stay engaged and actively participate. When our students do come into class, they are ready for us to get straight to the, the meat of what we were um, teaching online. And it's very much um, activity-based, um, hands-on learning. Um, we use a discussion board online, which allows each and every student to um, have that kind of safe, supportive environment to really talk about topics, which in social work practice can often be very sensitive. Um, very emotionally challenging, sometimes uh, emotionally draining, sometimes very personal. And I think that one of the best things is that it, it, it has an even playing ground for any student, whether you're one that can speak up very actively, uh, likes to talk out in class, or one that's very quiet. When you're using the discussion board online, it's, um, it kind of evens out where everyone feels safe. So where are we going? Um, we're just going to keep going. We've enjoyed it. Uh, we're excited about it and we're hoping to expand it, so thank you. My name is Kathy Stacy. I teach statistics. I've been teaching it about 15 years, and what was great listening to everyone on this panel was it made a little light bulb in my head go off that said, now I know what it was that got me to start using technology, and it was starting to teach freshmen. So when I taught I was very much a tra traditionalist, still am. I loved students up at the board, likes lots of pen and paper work, problem solving, conversation, discussion, spontaneity, so no PowerPoint, and it worked beautifully. I loved it, I was engaged, the students were engaged, they were successful, and then I started teaching freshmen. So the course shifted to probably 90% freshman enrollment, and what we were doing in class seemed to be working just great. They were happy, I was happy, and then they started taking exams. And they started turning in their projects, large data analysis projects that I had always had students do outside of class. And they, they were failing, they were doing awful. And they'd come to my office hours, and they'd say, you know, it all makes sense in class. I can really follow along. I know this stuff. And I'd say, well, you know, I took classes with Diane Scheller. I know exactly what that problem is called in educational psychology. It's a reality, right? You're in your zone. Um, but you need to learn to do these things on your own. And what they realized and what I realized was there was nothing going on outside the classroom to support them in developing the skills that we were learning to practice inside the classroom. So I didn't engage technology in an opportunity to, to change what was happening inside the classroom, but to change what was going on outside. And so I can give you a couple small examples of that. We turned to Canvas. Uh, we did a course transformation. We did a blended course. And in Canvas, we started creating various kinds of assessments that they could do, reading quizzes that were almost like reading guides, but they'd have an opportunity to try to apply what they had read before we talked about it, multiple opportunities to try that. We created these readiness assessment quizzes before exams so that every student, whether you were in a fraternity or sorority or not, had access to previous exam questions and you could take them online in a timed period and see how you did. And when I realized, well, what made me realize that that was working was uh, I had a group of students in my office and uh, all of them had done terribly on the readiness assessment quiz and they knew they had an exam coming up. And uh, 
they sat there and they complained and they talked about how they weren't ready and one of the students looked at him and said, I did terribly too. That's how I knew I wasn't ready. What are you complaining about? That's what it's for. And, they, and I thought, you keep talking. You're doing great. Just, just tell them how it is. And they had a wonderful conversation and we started identifying what they couldn't do and then how they could improve. We created online labs, so part of blending or flipping the course was we gave up a full third of the course to an online lab where the students could sit down in pairs with TA support and actually do some data analysis. We created online pre-labs that had video and walked them through a similar exercise on the same data set so they couldn't come in and be overwhelmed by what they had to do with the software. They could focus instead on the problem that they were trying to solve. And these things were just fantastic. They were going so well, and I realized that they were going to change what I did in the classroom as well. The first thing that changed was when my class grew to over 200 students, I realized I was scheduled in a room with no chalkboards. For me, that was like death. I didn't know what I was going to do. So I had to discover, I think Cynthia helped me, with a, a ThinkPad. You know, you can write on them. So I had to learn to have students come up to the board and actually write on the ThinkPad and project their work that way. We started using eye clickers, which meant we could collect real data, which actually made it easier than what we had done in the past, and we can work with that data. And we did eye clicker questions, and it just, it was more engaging for a large class to always feel like they were participating. So that was all great. I still didn't feel like I was an innovative technology user. I was using technology to do things I needed it to do. Last, well, I guess this fall, we just started work on an on-ramps course. So we're now taking our transform blended course and creating an entirely sort of self-sufficient uh, online course in Canvas that will be delivered by high school teachers in a dual credit classroom kind of environment. And the one thing that I'm resistant to doing is making videos because I, I, I'm scared to death of making videos. It's so inspiring to see you all up there talking so effortlessly. But I know that's what's next for me, and I'm just overcoming the fear of that. And once we have those videos, uh, we're going to have this really great deliverable with some additional online games, little mini games, to hit key concepts. Students don't even know they're learning the concepts because they're playing games, and Inspire Learning is helping us with that. So I'm really excited to see what that's going to look like. And I bet it's going to change what I do in the classroom again, because I'm going to want to use some of that with my students here at UT Austin. And then at the very end is the MOOC. So we're working on developing a MOOC as well. Let's give our panel a hand, please. As a recovering technophobe, I must say that the stories are compelling, if not contagious. Uh, and now we have an opportunity to do some discussion in small groups at your tables of some discussion questions that we've created in advance. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a question up on the board, uh, up on the screen. How about that for a slip? Um, and you'll get an opportunity in your small groups to discuss the question. And then we'll uh, stop you when it's time in about four or five minutes uh, so that we can do some electronic response to the question and we'll move on. Does that sound like a plan? All right, good, good. Where's our question? There we go. So our first question is, how do you use technology to enhance instruction? Enjoy it. If you came in late and don't have a table, please join in. Uh, there are plenty of seats available. And we'll probably do closer to two or three minutes rather than four or five. And look up at the screen. And the options are NA, I do not use technology, is answer A. Answer B, minimal, I use a learning management system and our PowerPoints or document cams or clickers. 
C is a moderate use of technology. I use a learning management system to provide learning modules outside of class, which include text and or video. And D being heavy use, a large fraction of my course materials are available to students on multiple online modes or E other. So take, take your choice. And then we have two microphones and we'll give you some opportunities. Okay, took us a moment, moment to get it going, but I think we're ready. Okay. Wow. Oops. Okay, so at this point we have two people with microphones, and I'd love to pick somebody. Uh, no one chose A, so that's good. You're all here. That makes sense. Um, I'd like to hear from somebody who chose B, minimal amount. Are you cour courageous, want to speak up? We have microphones. Tell me why you chose B. Somebody, raise your hand. Okay, let's start with E. Yeah, E is other. We're really curious about that one. So who answered E? OK, so we have some microphones. Let's hear, hear what the response to that is. Well, um, I don't actually teach a large course. I teach a laboratory course. And so we use out of class things for assignments and testing and learning. So actually. I have a, actually software that runs simulations of experiments that students do uh -huh. in class. And so we try to have students use simulations to look at the variables they can't actually observe in the actual experiments. So, um, and then we use a, a lot of other materials online, more conventional things like references that they can access. Excellent. And there was somebody else at your table that had a, an answer real quick? I don't teach. I'm an instructional designer and I consult with faculty. Oh, there you go. Well, that, that's a good answer then. Good answer. All right, let's move on to the next question. What are the benefits of technology enhanced learning? Let's discuss for a minute and then we'll give you your clicker question. We've already put up the options if you'd like to click in while you're still talking. They're up on the screen. Since the panelists have already spoken about this, we, uh, we won't um, do microphone responses. We'll move on to the next question after this. OK. Do we have a? Do I stop it? Yeah. Oh, they're still weighing in. Oh, you're still weighing in. We can take a sneak peek. That's where we are. There you go. OK, so we're going to stop. That must be other. <laughs> Out of the box thinkers choosing E. Got it? Okay, let's go on to the next question. What are what is the most substantial barrier to using technology enhanced instruction? So now we're going to discuss the barriers. Then we'll get some of uh, our feedback by clicker, some responses, and maybe turn to our panel in terms of their barriers. Okay, click in if you have not clicked in already, please. All right, we're going to look at the results to this. Okay, most people responded C. Faculty do not have time to create. And 
some Ds, the barriers are largely at institutional level. Um, and E's, there's some other. I'm curious, what does other mean to you? All of the above. All of the above. Very good. Very good. Good answer. Good answer. Um, perhaps we could ask our faculty at this point uh, on the panel uh, what the barriers have been. I think all of them are very excited about their work, but uh, it'd be interesting to hear what your perspective is about barriers and overcoming them. Well, I can certainly say that not being a technology, I guess, uh, native, that just literally learning what I would need to know to get the right people and ask the right questions is something that was a challenge. Uh, beyond that, uh, and this is more listening to other faculty, uh, you even hear um, what would seemingly be a less critical issue, such as how is it going to affect my evaluations? And do I want to get invested in this, uh, running the risk that it'll be even poorer than it was before, even for a short while? <laughs> and so there's uh, some anecdotal features that I think have been barriers I've observed. There you go. Other people have unique barriers that they'd like to bring to bear? Uh, let's wait for the microphone behind you. Thanks. Oh, okay. Um, I'm Martha Newman of Religious Studies. Sometimes the technology doesn't work. Uh -huh. <laughs> Ah, good point, good point. And um, we're always trying to win the confidence of our students. So until we ramp up and get comfortable with it, there are some disconnects there. Very good. Uh, I have another answer from the panel. I think, I think that's true. We've had terrific support. One thing I found is that the students claim the technology doesn't work. Ah. But when you have metrics, it turns out they do. We have lots of students who claim they were closed out from a quiz or something like that, and then we go and we find out that, in fact, they had submitted answers three seconds before the <laughs> curtain came down. So that, I think that's interesting. With respect to the broader point about uh, faculty resources, I mean, the one thing I think it's imperative is, look, it's a new startup, period. And, and I, look, it's not my money, but you have to provide summer instructional money if somebody's going to take the burden and pioneer a class in a particular department. I mean, flat out, there is no other incentive to do it. It is a major commitment of time and energy hmm. to do that. It is, it is a new prep plus. Um, so I mean, I, I think that you need to face that reality um, if departments are going to move in this direction. Let me suggest a, a, an alternative. I don't think that, that uh, summer funding is necessary. I, uh, You're a chair, right? I, I'm a chair. Yeah. Yeah, so I pay myself. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 the issue is is what the payoffs are. So for me, the payoffs of this even even before chair time is uh, I was thinking of this as a research enterprise as much as anything else. So if it's if this is just teaching and that's all, you're right. But if you are also thinking of this as a potential research opportunity, it's it's fabulous. But I there is one huge barrier to change. To move into this new technology, it, expect to spend a huge amount of time. I, I'm sure you experienced this this last semester. Yeah. Uh, the first time you do it is horrifying how many additional hours you put into it. There is a lot of work to it. And uh, then after that, then it's just a terrific amount of work. And then after that, maybe it's, it's just a lot of work. Yeah. But, <laughs> but the reality is, is the payoffs are incredible. Thank you very much. May I make a comment as well? Sure, please. Okay. So my thought on this is, is that if, if we're going to really be moving into this arena where we're going to be really heavily technology-based, we're moving towards needing to use adaptive learning tools and gamification. These are very expensive. They are very time-consuming. And one of the things that we've considered with Take Your Medicine is, do we develop a game that we can only use with Take Your Medicine, or do we develop it in a way that could be a platform for other people to use? I think it makes sense to do the latter. But that really requires an institutional investment. I mean, you can't just have three Python developers sitting in a room. And so, um, I've had many conversations with Harrison about this, about you know, what is the best strategy, but if we're really going to embrace it, it's an investment, because if faculty are going to invest time, you need to give them the tools. And so putting together that toolkit and identifying what needs to be in that toolkit is going to be really important, and, but then it could help 
everybody as they move forward as opposed to all of us tr creating different things that work for us, but they're not always going to be translatable to anyone else. If I, if I could piggyback off the incentive uh, observations as well. Uh, you know, I'm working with 17 faculty, and I would say there are about 17 different reasons they're incented to do this. And so I'm not so sure one size fits all, and so you have to need to kind of find the hot button. So for example, if I were to put these in buckets, I would say that uh, some of those would kind of fall in the category that it's the future, I really have to get on board here. And uh, so this is a great opportunity to do that. Another bucket would be that uh, the pay, strictly the pay. And this is more, depending on how it's structured, could be immediate pay, or if this is almost like you think of a book being produced, it could even be a royalty based incentive system. Another is just in technology enthusiasts. They do it at home alone anyway. And then the one I found most interesting was that I'll do it, the uh, dean asked me to do it, but I'll consider it sort of like service, you know, in our three, you know, service teaching and research. It's kind of my service category. That's an I excellent, wouldn't be doing it otherwise. Yeah, it's an <laughs> so. excellent way to categorize the spectrum. And I want to remind people that with the provost teaching faculty fellows who are working on innovative projects and the opportunity to submit for those projects, receive some resources, uh, and then become an expert in something to share that information throughout the university, uh, that there, there are opportunities for the funding and for uh, becoming an expert and training and disseminating what you learn. So thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Should technology enhanced instruction be required? And if so, to what degree? Okay, so here are your findings. No, the decision on how to teach a course should be made by the individual teaching the course. So rather than mandate, this is a personal decision. We just hope that, we know that for some people, the fear of using technology is a million miles high and a million miles wide. Um, we hope that via this discussion that it, it, it's starting to appear that the, that the barrier in itself is, is paper thin, that you just walk forward into it and try things. Uh, the things that fit your course. There's not a one size fits all very clearly uh, from the responses that we've received. So we have some comments from the audience. Go ahead. I would say, I'm Bill Beckner from Mathematics. I would say the answer to question one reflects the recent very strong statement by the president. The faculty are responsible for the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Very good. We can give that a hand. <laughs> Other, yeah, as somebody that had an opposite answer, who felt very strongly that this should be something that should be orchestrated or mandated or parts of de degree plans. Somebody want to talk about that a little bit? Here, let's get a microphone off. Thanks. Um, the, oh, I'm Olga Kutsaridi, and I'm a graduate student um, at the, in the classics department. Uh, so kind of an archaic department for technology, but we're doing our best with people like Jenna Ebler to change that and implement it further. Well, the funny thing about this uh, panel is that the people that need to be here, the people that need to be asked to use technology more actively are actually not here, ah, right? So we're already all pro-technology, so having sort of something that asks them or tells them you need to incorporate technology to some extent uh, will force those that are not here with us to use technology. Ah, excellent. There's why, another thought from the panel. An observa observation kind of consistent with that. Maybe it's baby steps. For example, in our MBA program, we decided as a committee in sort of re, uh, re, um, renewing the program that we would all incorporate a four-hour module. So it was a collective decision as a sort of an approach. And I think there are going to be some among those who might have been either resistant or naysayers to say, well, you know, that's actually kind of interesting, and I've learned something here. And so it's not as harsh as saying it's mandating it in a very dictatorial way, but it's sort of baby steps that help people become familiar with the technology and the opportunities. Thank you. Other thoughts from the panel before we wrap up? 
Okay, well, we want to thank you all for coming. We have surveys on the table. It would be very, very valuable to us to get your feedback about the event, other ideas that you may or may not have gotten to express. And uh, if we can, just one more hand for our panel. And thank you so much again, Provost, for, for orchestrating the event. Have a good day.